subscribe below. Every vote of support counts. Today, we are making time to speak with Mr. Jack Weatherford, the world's foremost leading scholar on Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire. He's written six books on tribal contributions. So we're doing this for Veterans Day, right? Genghis Khan was a warrior and came from extremely humble beginnings in the steppes of Central Asia. And yet somehow he took that warrior and uh, tribal spirit and built the single largest empire the world has ever known. Uh, he led a massive bureaucracy with complicated contributions from currency and religious freedom and tolerance. So I asked Professor, Professor Weatherford to join us to discuss Genghis Khan in the lens of Veterans Day. We live in a nation with relatively high underemployment in the veteran community or uh, unemployment, underemployment. And when vets leave the service, many don't know how to communicate the enterprise value of their service to the private sector. So to me, Genghis Khan represents the versatility and ingenuity of the warrior spirit. And I think as veterans, we have a lot to learn from him. So, Professor Weatherford, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Rajiv. And also, thank you for your service to the country. Uh, since we are in Veterans Month, uh, I think it's very important to acknowledge the, the contributions of the younger generation in the recent conflicts abroad. So thank you for all that you've done for the country. Oh, I very much appreciate that, sir. Uh, so I have, you know, read literally all of your books. I got the three specifically on Genghis Khan right here, which uh, these are like some of my favorites. Um, I want to start off by asking um, a piece of pushback that I got from one of my veteran friends. He said, wait a minute, why on earth would we admire Genghis Khan? Wasn't he this tyrant, murderer, vicious leader, dictator. Um, there's this bad reputation or myths uh, and rumors about how evil and violent this man was. Are, they, are those rumors and myths true? Can you give us a sense of Geng Genghis Khan's uh, character? Well, you know, I think every leader in history, uh, like all of us, we have good sides, we have bad sides. No one is gonna be perfect. There are certainly things to criticize. But I put myself uh, in a tradition that today isn't quite so popular. And, and many people, like your friend, of course, look negatively on Genghis Khan. But I go back to Geoffrey Chaucer, the first writer in the English language. And he wrote one of his Canterbury Tales about Genghis Khan. And he called him the greatest lord there was. Because at that time, there was tremendous respect for him and for what he did. It's only much later. I think in part because of the development of more racist attitudes in Western history towards Asia. At first, the West was a little more open and accommodating in some places. And then later on, they turned against Genghis Khan. Uh, but I would, uh, my whole career here with him is devoted to, I don't want to say rehabilitating him, but going back to people such as uh, Chaucer, who saw great respect in him, and I, I've looked back at that, and I tend to agree with them. There are certainly things that he should be criticized for, like all of us. But overall, I think he's one of the greatest leaders in the history of the world. Fantastic. Your, your books, Professor, cover a variety of topics of tribal life around the globe. You've written about Native Americans. You've written a book called The History of Money. I mean, just at a personal level, what sparked this interest in tribal life in you? And how did you know you want to make this your career focus? I really can't say. It's like, how did I, what really sparked uh, my love for my wife? You know, I could see a hundred, our sense of humor, the way she looked, the way she acted. Uh, there's so many things. And yet in the end, I don't know what it was. I don't know. And it's sort of like this with the, with the tribal issue. I, I do believe part of it was, you know, I was being, I was trained in uh, very traditional fields. And I also went to the university in Germany and I was doing my doctoral research in Germany. And I lived in a small village outside of Frankfurt, about 30 minutes away. And in this village, I looked back on 2000 years of history since Roman times. And I was very surprised at the introduction of these crops from America, such as the potato, and then the impact that cotton had on their uh, textile industry, these things. And I thought, you know, I missed that in school. I got to go back to America. and just to get that book from the library. I couldn't find it. And so I, that was sort of the beginning of this, wait a minute, tribal people have had an impact in the world. 
And I want to make sure that that's brought out in our history. So I never really decided that was my goal in my career, but from that one little episode, I think it grew into my career. Fantastic. So you, in your research, have spent a lot of time in Mongolia. And I was wondering if maybe we could start off by just setting the scene for us as we get in the headspace of Genghis Khan. Uh, can you help, help us understand what are the steps of Mongolia like, the weather, culture, food, landscape, uh, just trying to get in the headspace of a tribal family on the steppes in uh, Siberia? Well, for me, it's the most beautiful place in the world. We start with that. But for a lot of people, it's, it's uh, a little bit more problematic. You have to think that Mongolia is uh, a large country you know, about the size of Western Europe, and yet it only has 3 million people. I sometimes say it's a population of Rome spread out in a country that's five times the size of Italy. So it's uh, very sparsely populated, 3 million people, and now approximately, uh, approximately 60 million animals. It's far, far too many, I think. Huge animal population. But uh, Mongolia in the north, there are a few very low mountains that go across the, the edge with Siberia. Then we have mostly the steppe. And the steppe leads into the Gobi. And depending on how much rain in any given year, the steppe ends in one area and the Gobi begins in that area, or it changes the next year slightly. So it's mostly a large flat country with a few low mountain ranges. And what's so special about Mongolia though, is that especially when I went there 22 years ago, when I began with Mongolia in the 1990s, when I arrived there and I realized I leave the city and I can go anywhere I want. There's no private property. I can go any direct, there's no road, but it's like sailing on the land. You have to know where you're going, but you can go anywhere. And I thought, where on earth can you do that? It doesn't matter whether you're in uh, Tokyo, New York, Calcutta. There's a street and you go on the street. You can't just go across anything you want. From Mongolia, you go any direction you want. And it creates a independence in the people that I really admired from the beginning. And of course, the environment is one of the harshest in the world. The altitude is not... Um, so bad, it's so average is about 5,000 feet, so more or less like Denver up there. So it's a high plateau with a few mountains, but it is extremely cold. Winter is basically about, more or less about nine months in our perspective. And uh, in, in January, you have many days that are gonna be minus 35. And almost every wow. winter, it, it will hit minus 50 at some point, uh, not, every year, but mostly. So it's a cold, cold country. Not too much snow, actually, because it's too cold to snow. The snow comes in the fall and in the spring. So it's this incredible land. And uh, when, the, when the spring snows come and then they melt, and all of a sudden the flowers come out on the steppe, and millions of birds come in from South Asia, especially uh, the beautiful cranes come flying in to mate and to raise their young before the next winter comes. It's a, a paradise on earth for me. Wow, that's a beautiful description, sir. Thank you for that. Um, so one thing that I learned about Genghis Khan in your book that I thought was really interesting that I think relates a lot to veterans is this concept of like trauma and violence at an early, like formative age. And so we learned that, you know, Genghis Khan's father was murdered, uh, I believe by the Tartars, if I'm not mistaken. His uh, wife was kidnapped and he actually killed his stepbrother. And, you know, these seem like very traumatic events for any young person. And I'm curious, how do you think early experiences of violence and trauma in GK's life impacted his leadership persona and his leadership of the Mongols? I think the events that you just mentioned are some of the most important in his life. And I think they were with him forever. Uh, the fact that, I mean, the trauma, I would say, often starts before you're even born. I mean, his case, his mother was kidnapped. She was married to one man. She was kidnapped from him by his father. So he already began life in this very ambiguous uh, 
situation where some people within the tribe didn't even recognize his mother as a real wife because she had been kidnapped. So, and then at uh, age eight, his father was killed, as you say, by the Tartars, the Tatars. And then uh, it was a very traumatic scene and is recorded very carefully in the secret history of the Mongols, which is the Mongolian version of his life that was composed just a few years after he died by a, by a stepbrother who wrote it all down. And uh, his father uh, died, I think, in the fall of the year, probably. I'm not exactly sure. And his family, so his mother and the four children and his father's other wife and her two children, they all seem to be okay through that first winter. But spring is a rough time in Mongolia, many places of the world. You know, the, the winter food is exhausted. There's no grass for the animals to eat. Many animals have died in the winter. Um, Hunters have been out, they've hunted the animals in the area. And so it's a very difficult time. And the Mongols uh, were preparing then to move on. His clan was moving on, his father's people, in the spring of the year. And then they held a feast, as they always did, to honor their ancestors with some meat that they burned the meat for the ancestor just before they moved off to spring pasture. And his mother wasn't invited, and so she came. And then one of the old queens... Uh, who, whose husband had died some years before, said, you know, you're the one for whom we don't have to invite. The law says we don't have to invite you. And then at the end of these ceremonies, the two old queens who were still alive uh, said, we will move on without this woman and her children. And they did. They moved on. And his mother was a very brave woman. She grabbed a banner of her dead husband. And she jumped on her horse and she ran around the tribe like this. And they were so shamed that they stopped, but only until the night. And then they could start slipping away. And only one old man came out to object. And that old man was killed for objecting. And Temujin, as he was called, Chinggis Han's name was Temujin. Temujin saw this and the secret history says he cried. Here's this eight or nine year old boy seeing somebody being killed, his mother being deserted on the step. I mean, it was trauma, it was absolutely incredible for him. And I think it stuck with him his entire life. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and then he grows up and he becomes this warrior. He develops a feud uh, with his childhood friend, uh, Jamuka. Um, and talk to us about the expanse of this empire. I mean, this this young man from the steppes of Siberia in the middle of nowhere. You know, one of the things that I thought was really interesting in your, to compare and contrast in your book was like Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was the son of, uh, he was a prince. He was educated by Aristotle. Like world domination was kind of the baseline in many ways. <laughs> Whereas Genghis Khan was this like tribal like a uh, very poor kid from the steppes of Siberia. And he grows, he grows this massive Mongolian empire. Like, can you put this in perspective for our listeners today? Like just how big and relevant is this uh, Mongol empire? Well, the Mongol empire was certainly the largest in the history of the world. A few people will jump up and say, oh, but later the British empire was larger. But that's only if you include all the different pieces there were different times and you put them into one time. So India and the United States uh, were not in the, the same time. But Genghis Khan's empire uh, was more than four times the size of Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, we came to say it was an empire in a way, it was a conquest. But the day he died, uh, his empire died with him. Uh, it didn't last. It was immediately divided up among the generals. Whereas with Genghis Khan, it lasted for a hundred years. But if you think about what he conquered, uh, he conquered China, uh, he conquered Russia, he conquered Central Asia, all the stands of Central Asia, he conquered Iraq and Iran, conquered the uh, Caucasus, and all the way to Afghanistan, which actually turned out to be one of his favorite places in the world. So he conquered all of these areas, and then after he died, his sons went on to complete the, con the conquests and fulfill it and push the empire even larger. 
So no one in history has done anything like that. Nothing like that. Like you say, he came from nowhere. And yet he did this with a nation of no more than one million people and an army of no more, more than 100,000. And he came up against armies that were large as his nation. China probably had a million soldiers at that time. Unbelievable. And, you know, one thing that I think is really fascinating, and again, to the to the reason why I even wanted to pursue this conversation is that he somehow was this like gritty tribal warrior with this heart and soul on the battlefield that you can clearly see. But where did he get the competence to run this huge bureaucracy, right? Those seem like very different skill sets. How do you think he got that leadership, that business acumen to not only, you know, win wars on the battlefield, but to run this empire? Yeah, that's, that's a, uh, I can only speculate about some of those things, you know. You look back and you just wonder. It's no one else in history had ever done anything like that. What do you think... Part of it was he developed this extreme ability to learn from his mistakes. And all of us think we learn from our mistakes, when in fact, most of the time, I think we're just repeating those mistakes. We go on and we, we think we've learned from them. But in his case, he was very clear and he would point out his own mistakes very quickly and the mistakes of others. But he did not punish people around him for their mistakes. He would go over the mistakes very carefully with him to try to figure out how it should have been done. Because sometimes he himself didn't know how it should have been done. They had to sort of figure together. But one example was when in one of his first wars, you can imagine now he's never left the steppe so far as we know. He's never seen a building so far as we know, a wall of any kind. I mean, he, Mongolia is a different world, even more different then, but he arrives and then he's going to uh, attack the Tangut people who are in the sort of central northern part of China. Now it's a part of China. At that time, it was a, a kingdom, the Tangut kingdom. He's going to attack. And so he had the idea or somebody told him, or I don't know how it came up, that they could divert the small river there to knock down the walls of that city, a man who's never fought a, a battle against a city before. And so they re-diverted the river and they flooded themselves. Well, he immediately learned from that. Uh, he repeated it though by finding out the way to do it correctly without having the water flood himself. And then they were able to use water and they used it for the next 50 years. They used that tactic in city after city and the greatest accomplishment was with the taking of Baghdad, uh, when they were able to, uh, once again, divert the water to destroy the walls. So you're not using the men to have to do it. So there were episodes like that over and over where he learned. Also, I think we look at this huge disadvantage he had of having no formal education, a society with no written language, with no books, uh, with no cities, nothing like that. But on the other hand, there was a unique advantage in it. And that first he learned to live for himself, how to support himself out in the wild. He learned how to do that. But also he was open to anybody's idea. He had no set of beliefs. You think about a European culture or Chinese culture, Indian culture. They have thousands of years of tradition already. You grow up in that society like Alexander the Great growing up you said with Aristotle as his teacher and his father, uh, King Philip, he grows up and he's already in a system. Genghis Khan from the beginning had to create it and he knew he couldn't do it himself. He had to borrow and he would look for things that worked. One of the first things, two years before he formed his nation, he formed the nation in, in 1206, two years before in the year uh, 1204, he adopted an alphabet from the Uyghur people and they had used a Sogdian alphabet. So he took that in from another people and applied it to his country, even though he himself had no formal education. But to him, it, he would have taken whatever worked everywhere in the world. And it was the same with the tactics. It was the same later when they encountered um, fireworks and some very, very simple 
incendiary devices in China. And they were able to take those and develop them into much more serious weapons over time. Super interesting. So the big takeaway is he was astute at, I, I think I hear a couple things. One, he was very self-aware and he had this honesty about his own performance, his own mistakes, that he was able to analyze them and very quickly learn from the mistakes, adapt and implement the solutions to those mistakes so that uh, he wouldn't repeat them. And I agree, that's something that I think we all say we do, like, oh, I learned from our mistakes, but you know, perhaps there's this internal psychological narrative, like a little bit of a defense mechanism that we have to almost justify uh, our behaviors uh, from before. And so it sounds like Genghis Khan had this unique ability to sort of bypass that, uh, uh, that security blanket, if you will, in his head and really have an honest look at his performance and where he could improve. Would, would that be a good characterization? No, I, yes, I agree with that. And I think part because people who grow up in the bottom of society, they really have to learn how to manipulate the world a little bit. They learn, they have to do it to survive. You grow up uh, in an upper class environment or even a middle class, you have so many supports under you that you're allowed to have these delusions. But Genghis Khan, if he had a delusion about what he could do or not do, uh, he could have lost his life. And there were several times when he nearly did. He was captured and enslaved for a while. He was put into a, a kank, a yoke that an ox would be kept in. He was put in this kank and uh, he had to escape from that. His life was on the line. Uh, learning for him, he could not afford to have any delusions. Most of us, society comforts us with our delusions. And starting from early in life, our own parents often comfort us with little delusions, you know. We make some silly drawing in kindergarten and the next thing it's up on the refrigerator is there a great work of art and they put a bumper sticker on the car and it, well, none of that for Genghis Khan, none of that. He had a harsh, harsh life and he had to learn very quickly how to judge people. And that was a, it's another point that a great characteristic he had he judged people very quickly, and almost no one was ever disloyal to him who was equal to him or below him in status. People above him would betray him. His own, his father's own relatives had betrayed him, left him on the step to die with his mother and siblings. But his colleagues, they never betrayed him. His generals never betrayed him. And he didn't even pretend to be the best general. He wasn't, and he knew that. But he had one in particular who was. Fantastic. Actually, I want to uh, dive deeper on this uh, very interesting topic, his, his relationship with his peers and his subordinates. So we had a question come in from uh, a member of our book club, uh, Olivier Fleischmann, who asks, meritocracy and loyalty seem to be a reoccurring yet conflicting theme in GK's leadership style. He seemed to simultaneously disavow nepotism in his ranks until the end of his life, of course, where he left his empire to his children, but yet extended his loyalty to his enemies. And one of my favorite examples of this is Jamuka, who is his, uh, his rival. Um, Jamuka's own soldiers betray Jamuka and bring him to Genghis Khan and say, hey, we've brought your enemy. And actually Genghis Khan does not dispose of Jamuka, but actually disposes of Jamuka's soldiers that betrayed him. Uh, for their disloyalty. So how, what do we learn from GK's use of meritocracy and loyalty and how could that potentially apply to our professional relationships uh, you know, if there is a lesson to learn? Well, I think you put the finger on, it, it is a set of conflicting values. And with most of us, our values do at some point in life conflict. Uh, they don't form some harmonious whole and I think uh, early in his life, he was very much uh, into the idea about meritocracy because he didn't have any relatives hardly that he had to worry about. His, most of his relatives had, uh, uh, had uh, already deserted him. He had killed his half brother, as you mentioned, in an early struggle when they were very young teenagers. And uh, so he didn't have very many relatives at first. But then later on, as he has sons and grandsons and daughters and granddaughters, uh, then 
he begins to soften in his old age. And I think he felt very keenly uh, this difference, you know, that he was loyal to his men throughout most of his life, and they were certainly very loyal to him. But in the end, he wanted his sons to inherit the empire, and also he wanted parts of it to be given to his uh, wives and parts of it to be given to his daughters. He was, uh, in the end, family won out with him, but it was his own family that he had created, not the family to which he was born. Very interesting. Let's let's talk again about uh, his family. Uh, we had another question come in from another member of our club, uh, Amber Mace, uh, who asked, they would like to contrast GK's leadership of the empire with the chaos that ensued with his sons and grandsons. I mean, these grandchildren fought and killed each other for, I mean, one would argue superficial purposes, right? This is just power and money. Uh, so though GK was an amazing leader, could we say that he was perhaps a below average parent, uh, maybe an absent father? How do you think Genghis Khan balanced his responsibilities as both a, a leader and a parent. Yes. Okay. Um, those are strong words. <laughs> uh, but but um, I agree with the point. I just have to soften it a little bit and go back to the issue about he did not have a father growing up, basically. Even when his father uh, was st uh, still alive, uh, his father was off fighting a war when Temujin was born. The father wasn't there for that. How much of the first eight years his father was there, I do not know, but he was very much an absentee father in the life of Temujin. And then he was dead when the boy was about eight or nine years old. So he didn't have it. And then to be kicked out of the tribe, he had no male relative to whom he could look. His father's brothers all turned against him and uh, deserted him. So he grew up under a very strong mother and he greatly respected her all the days of his life. Uh, she saved those children, their lives, when they were put out to die on the steps. She saved every one of them. And so he was forever beholden to her for that. But when it came time to being a father himself, he was also off. I don't think he ever thought about the role of being a father. I just don't think it was a concept in his mind until much later in life, when already while he was still alive, he saw his sons beginning to quarrel. And he was very perplexed by it. He didn't know what to do. Uh, he, he would call his sons in, he would berate them, he would argue with them. He would go to the battlefield, try to straighten things out. He didn't know what to do. He really suffered in that time. And you can see the conflict in his mind. And so he, he tried at that point to train his sons, but it was too late. They were middle-aged men, and he's out there trying to train them how to cooperate with each other, uh, how to fight better battles and all. It was too late. And he realized that. He realized that. And I think if I had to say what is the greatest sadness of his own life, projecting myself into his mind somehow, I would say it, it was the way things turned out with his sons arguing. And I think that's one reason he turned so much towards his daughters and relied on them heavily because they were not arguing among themselves and they were not fighting with their brothers. Uh, they were administering the territories given to them very effectively. And uh, he seemed to be very proud of them and he seemed to get some nourishment from them that he lacked from his sons and it's a great tragedy in his life, I feel. I want to come back to his daughters and uh, your book, uh, the, the, the Queens of the Mongol Empire, because I think this is really important. But I also want to contrast this tragedy in life uh, with his sons with something that I think is actually one of the biggest prides of his life, which is his relationship with his wife, uh, Borte. Um, I think from your book, what I learned was that his relationship with his wife was a really a true genuine love. And I'm just curious if you could tell us a little bit about your interpretation of GK's uh, wife's impact on his leadership and his life story. Well, there's no question that she had a great impact. 
uh, as it was the custom at that time, and so often today in Mongolia, she was a little bit older than he was. Uh, he met her just a, f just a few weeks before his father's death. And so he was eight years old when he met her. She was nine years old, more or less, when, when they met. And um, the secret history says, you know, it was fire in her eyes and fire in her cheeks. There was fire in his eyes and fire in his cheeks. I don't know about it, eight and nine years old, but that's the time at which uh, they started. And then when he was about 16 or maybe even 15, she came to live with him as his wife, but it was only a few months before she was kidnapped. And that was the great decision, I think, of his life. What do you do? Your wife has been taken. Uh, should you go find another wife? Should you go searching somewhere? Should you, what should you do? And, and he decided then, that he would not live his life if he couldn't have her back. He would do whatever it would take to get her back. And it's one of the most moving scenes in the secret history when he finally comes in into the camp where she had been taken and uh, she didn't know who was attacking the camp and she and the other women were loaded into carts to be taken away uh, from the war, from the battle. And he attacked at night it was a full moon, and he was calling out her name and calling out her name. And she was on the cart, and she heard her name being called. Burst, burst. And she jumped from the cart, and she ran towards him. And it was because it was night, and she was on the foot, and she ran towards him. He had first almost struck her, thinking that she was a soldier. And then when he saw it was his wife, he jumped from the horse, and he stopped fighting. He felt like it was over. He had what he wanted in life. But of course, he had started a fight. He had started another feud. And those feuds never ended. She stood by him through everything. Uh, she never wavered. And she was quick to criticize him, uh, very quick to point out. He was very strong in the military aspects. But often in the family aspects, he was a little bit weak, and she would quickly criticize him. And it's recorded in the secret history because the, the tents are very small, these gears in which the Mongols live, and everybody could hear everything. So everybody would hear what she would be saying to him. And uh, she was loyal to him. He had three other wives in his life. He had four wives. and She did not seem to object. Her, her sons did come first always, and she made sure of that. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and I'd love to definitely go back to what we just spoke about with the role of GK's daughters and basically women in the Mongol Empire. It's one thing I was very surprised to hear was that, you know, uh, the regents played such a powerful role in the empire. So could we talk a little bit about the conception of really feminism in ancient Mongolian culture. Like how on earth did women gain so much power? What, what is it about Mongolian culture that let women advance so highly in the ranks compared to say uh, other you know, tribal cultures where women weren't necessarily allowed to have a lot of power? Yes, feminism is too modern a word. It's just uh, <laughs> simply a different system, a uh, different uh, tribal system. But you can imagine there are nomads and uh, much of the time, the men are off with the animals. The women have to run the homestead. And so in that situation, the women own the gear, the tent. They own it. His wives each had their own. They own, he never owned one in his life. Men did not own it. The women also owned all carts. All carts belong to women. And the gear, the home itself, belonged to women. They handle all the commerce because they were the ones buying and selling things. The men handled hunting, they handled herding, and they handled ra raiding. That was the man's responsibility. So he was. they were quite accustomed to going away for months at a time and eventually for years and leaving the women back in charge. And as his territory grew, then the territory he would leave in the hands of his wife was larger and larger and larger. So finally, it's basically the whole country. Then he adapted this system in a new way. As I said, he had only about 100,000 soldiers. He couldn't afford to leave them behind to administer someplace that had sworn loyalty to them or that they had conquered. 
And so when the place swore loyalty to him voluntarily, then he appointed his wife, oh, I'm sorry, he appointed one of his children, daughters, to manage that place. And he would arrange for her to marry the king. Right away you see, ah, yes, that's just like the European system. Then, no, she married the king, but the king went off with the army, with Genghis Khan. He went to serve, and he was very clear in these long instructions he gave his daughters that he gave them those people to rule. And he was very clear, and I give them to you, and uh, the most important thing is your honor on how you execute this. So he was clear about it, and the women then started running the Silk Route because there were several different daughters, and I think they were always not his 100% daughters. They could be clan daughters or adopted daughters. Sometimes we weren't sure who they were exactly, but they were running all the little kingdoms on the Silk Route. He did not assign them to run uh, kingdoms that fought against him and had rebelled. So his daughters were incredible. Then the daughters-in-law, you talk about the regents, these are all daughters-in-law. He married each of his sons to a Christian woman. These were tribal Christian women from a Mongolian steppe, much different from any kind that we know. Uh, but nevertheless, they were educated women who could uh, read and write. He was very good, just as he was very good at picking soldiers and leaders, he was very good at picking uh, wives for his sons, and he knew they needed very intelligent wives. And so his son who became the great Khan after Genghis Khan died, his name was Agude Khan, his wife was named Dorijin. And Dorijin began ruling the empire while her husband was still alive. And then when he died, she ruled that empire uh, for another five years. So all in all, she probably ruled about seven years. This is the largest empire ever in the history of the world to be ruled by a woman. And when I say ruled, I mean ruled. She wasn't a figurehead, she ruled it. And then in the end, she turned it over again, unfortunately. She had this worthless son, just absolutely worthless son. And yet, for whatever reason, she loved him. And her husband had wanted another son from another wife to become his, his own heir. But she, of course, wanted her son Greek. And it's even the name, it's just Greek. <laughs> but uh, his son once said, he's a rotten egg. He's a rotten egg, you know, the father said of the son. So she turned it over to him. And for better or worse, uh, he only lived 18 months. He made a mess of things. And then his wife also took over. Uh, Okal Hamish was her name. Uh, she, unfortunately, was not as good as her mother-in-law was, and she caused a lot of problems and more dissension uh, among the family than her mother-in-law. But her mother-in-law, Dorijin, was one of the great queens of world history. Fantastic. I mean, it's just so incredible to think about how um, even in the Mongol Empire, the largest empire of a war in the world, uh, there was a period of time where uh, a woman was in charge of it. And uh, I think that's just a, a great story. Um, I'd love to ask you a little bit. You invoked uh, that uh, every one of his sons, GK sons, married a Christian. And this is something a lot of people don't know. And you wrote a book exclusively about GK and the quest for God. And it's really one of the most interesting things I took away is like, how religiously open and tolerant the Mongol Empire was. I mean, they had Muslims, they had Buddhists, they had Christians, they had so many different faiths, Hindus, um, and they made it work. And this is a period of time where religion is actually a very critical part of tribal life. Uh, even in the opening uh, you know, segment in your book, uh, there's this uh, mountain that uh, GK goes and effectively like has a spiritual experience with and prays to that is so important to a soul. So can you talk to us a little bit about how the Mongol Empire was so became so religiously tolerant? Why was there not more um, uh, conversion, uh, forced or otherwise? Yes, he was very tolerant, but he himself always worshipped the mountain, Burkhan Haldun, and the eternal blue sky. That's the, the phrase that's used in Mongolian, the eternal blue sky. Uh, he never varied in that. 
However, he recognized that, that all religions had something to offer. Sometimes for him, he was a very practical person. Uh, so when he looked around and he saw that the Manichaeans, which is a very, today, uh, mostly forgotten religion, but they had a stronghold uh, on the steppes of, uh, of, of Cambodia, uh, sorry, the steppes of Mongolia at this time. And when uh, he saw them, he took their alphabet. That was the most important thing from them that he could take. And so he was borrowing from different religions and he recognized that they had various attributes. It was as though they were all on different roads headed towards the same thing. His road was to pray to the mountain and to pray to the eternal blue sky. But he saw that other people around him had other roads. But the way in which this became a policy actually was just something sort of unexpected in his life. He didn't set out to be religiously tolerant. That was, I don't think the idea ever crossed his mind. But the first people to come to him after he had conquered Mongolia and he had not yet invaded any other country, but the Uyghurs of the far west of China, they came to him because they were under the rule of this uh, fan fanatical, if you can say such a thing, a fanatical Buddhist king uh, who had seized the power. And in fact, he had not started off as a Buddhist. He had been a Christian before he came into this uh, Karakatai kingdom and he married the daughter of the king and then he overthrew the king. And he was imposing this new kind of fundamentalist um, Buddhist religion on people and outlawing the, the Muslim faith. And they came to Genghis Khan and they asked him for liberation, to liberate him. And he sent an army in and liberated those people. And this was a crucial moment in the laws that he made because at the end of this liberation of those people, you have to look back in history, there have been a few leaders who were tolerant of different religions, but it was always of the religion, it's of the priest, of the monastery, of the temple, of, of the religion in a formal way. But Chinggis Khan recognized that in addition to that, every person, every person had the right to choose religion. And this was the first law he ever made outside of his own country. That every person could choose a religion for him or herself and anybody who forced a religion on a person should be executed. Uh, anybody who prevented a person from uh, following the religion of their choice should be executed. We don't know that he ever executed anybody for that, but that was the law that he passed. That is the first law in history of religious freedom for every individual, not just for monks and priests and temples, but for the individual to choose. And it came just in a practical way. I think, you know, he saw that on the step, most of the fighting was over women. And so his first law for his own nation was outlaw the kidnapping of women, outlaw the sale of women, because his mother had been in that situation and his wife, and he was terribly afflicted by that throughout his life. It wasn't because he was ideologically a feminist, but because he saw the suffering in his own life. And he saw that much of the fighting on the step came from the kidnapping of women. But he also saw that among civilized people, so-called, much of the fighting came from fighting over religion. So right away, he wanted a law to give every person religious freedom. And he stuck to that always. Absolutely unbelievable. I mean, we're talking ancient history here. And he had the foresight to yeah. see religious freedom, not just in terms of virtue, but also in terms of just pragmatism. It was a, a better way to run his empire. You know, uh, towards the end of your book, uh, Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World, I was actually really stunned to hear about the effect that a pandemic played in the downfall of the Mongols. I believe it was a bubonic plague. Uh, and it was already a time of political division and conflict within the empire. And I couldn't, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you if there were any interesting parallels that you could see on the effect that COVID is having on the United States and the world during a similar period of division and unrest. Uh, are there any lessons that we as Americans can take away from how the plague 
affected the Mongol Empire that we can apply to making our nation stronger. This is a case, though, in which the Mongols did not solve that problem, unfortunately. I mean, it came a hundred years after Genghis Khan himself, but the empire, it already had, had fault lines in it. I mean, it's just like when a diamond's hit with a hammer, it breaks on the fault lines. And uh, this happened with the empire, it broke on the fault lines, but the hammer was the plague, the bubonic plague. And it's just one of these ironies of history always works out. The thing that made the empire really strong was commerce. It wasn't conquest. A hundred thousand men, they cannot rule nations of a hundred million people, you know. And so, but he made this system of commerce and mer merchants were moving back and forth, just like the Polo brothers, uh, Nicol uh, Nicolo Maffeo, and then their, their uh, son and nephew, Marco Polo. They went to China, they came back. People were moving around and trading. And that made a path, of course, for disease also to move around. And uh, the plague took a while. At first, the system was going just fine because uh, horses don't get the plague and the Mongols were dependent on horses. Or the plague come mostly from the fleas attached to rats and other things. But in time, there are enough rats and fleas in the carts going by uh, that the plague gets going and builds up a certain uh, momentum. And then it just wipes through the world, uh, especially through Europe, of course, that lost about a third of its people. Uh, there was worse in Europe than in Asia for reasons that we don't understand really, but uh, that, that was the worst hit by the plague. And it was really the edges of the Mongol Empire. Most of Europe was not in the Mongol Empire. So it's rather unusual that it would strike that way. But uh, the Mongols could not recover from that because people started closing down their cities. And the thing that allowed them, uh, allowed different people in different little communities around the world to tolerate the Mongol rule was the fact that they were benefiting from the trade. But once the trade went, the whole empire fell apart. I don't want to even try to draw a parallel more than that with a, a modern situation. I think we also see that trade, which has built this modern system, globalization in the last few centuries here, especially in the last few decades even, it's always double-edged. Yes, it brings goods from here to there and we can all benefit from this and that, it doesn't take long for the viruses or for the plague or for the fleas or for something to also benefit from it. And I think our very system that's created the fastest transportation system in the history of the world has also created the fastest moving plagues in the world. And I fear this isn't going to be the only one. There will be others to follow. And can we recover from this? I certainly hope so. I think so. But I look at the Mongols and it took a long time for the world system to recover. When the Mongol system collapsed, it was a long time before, in this case, the Europeans then rose up and they created the next world system. But it was centuries in between. Today, we certainly hope it won't be that way. Of course, of course. Yeah, it's, it's so insightful uh, to think that the... Uh, in both situations, that level of commercial interconnectedness and uh, connectivity across borders, um, while it has its merits and virtues, it also can be a vulnerability in itself, uh, particularly in a, in a time of a pandemic. Uh, sir, this has just been a phenomenal conversation. Uh, I'd like to start wrapping up here and ask you, you know, even when we first met, uh, you, you know, in, in any of, every one of your public uh, appearances, it's very clear that you care deeply about Mongolia. And um, I'm just curious if you could just speak a little bit about that passion, um, what you see in Mongolia today, what are some of the messages that those of us who are not so familiar with this part of Central Asia should be taking away from this region? And uh, I'd be interested to hear on uh, if you're working on any projects, research, et cetera, that you, you'd love to mention to us as well. I think the first point is that the Mongol nation is still here. Genghis Khan founded in 1204. 
It's been invaded. It's lost some wars. It's gone through a lot. But the Mongol nation is still here. And I think many of us just look at it as the past, but it's a vital nation. And the mere fact that they've survived for 800 years, the same people with the same language, without ever having a religious war, within, uh, the fact that they've survived all of that, there are things that we can learn from them. I think also just from Genghis Khan himself, there are things that we can learn. He was a man who had a vision. It wasn't born in him. He developed his vision and it changed over life, but he was guided by a vision of what the world should be and how people should live. And sometimes I, I, I fear that today the leaders just don't have that. And I'm not talking about one country or one party or one year or one... I just think that we've lost our way with vision. It's something missing. Our vision today just seems to be the acquisition of things. And yes, I'm doing okay. I've succeeded. My life is good. I have a good job. Or my pension plan is growing. Or, or I've become a mega billionaire. We've lost a vision. Chengiz Han was the most powerful, arguably the most powerful person in the history of the world with his empire. And he died as poor as he was born, in a tent, never had a house, never allowed a temple, uh, temple to be built for him, never allowed a tomb to be built for him. He still died a simple man, a very simple man. So I think there are lessons like that that we can learn. And yes, I love Mongolia. I love Mongolia very much. And I look at it, and it's a very small democracy sitting out there with only 3 million people. Many, many countries have been striving for democracy and could not create it. And Mongolia struggles. It has problems, but every country with democracy has problems. But it's still there. I think that the world still can learn a lot from Mongolia. And so I, I hope for the best for Mongolia, of course. And I, I just feel a, a special passion when I'm there, when I'm out on the step and I look out on the horizon and I can see forever in every direction and not see one road or building or anything, there's a connection with the earth. And somewhere on this earth, we need a place like that. We need Mongolia. That is an absolutely uh, phenomenal and beautiful uh, image to, to end our session on. Professor Weatherford, I am just so grateful for you to spend some time. I know you're, you're actually in Cambodia as we speak. It's, I imagine, about 9, 9.30 p.m. your time. It's now about 7 p.m., 7 a.m. here on the, on the West Coast of California. Uh, it is just such an honor to connect with you. And I think I speak on behalf of our entire club where we're just uh, so grateful for your, your time today, but also just the amount of work you've put into your research. I think it's uh, going to carry on for, for generations and really inspire uh, many of us in our leadership styles going forward. Thank you for having me, Rajiv, and thank all of your uh, viewers for allowing me this time with them. And once again, I salute you and I salute all those veterans out there. There's something we need to learn from our veterans and we need to rethink a lot of things about them. But thank you for what you've done for our country and for what you continue to do for the country and now for the world through your new work. My pleasure, sir. So, folks, thanks again for uh, tuning in for this wonderful conversation with Professor Jack Weatherford, uh, author of uh, many books, on, uh, six books on uh, tribal history, uh, definitely the world's foremost scholar on Jing uh, Genghis Khan. Uh, his book, uh, Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World, uh, is what provoked this discussion. We learned a lot today. And uh, I hope you'll tune in uh, for the rest of our Veterans Day programming uh, in the